When news of his arrest arrived, I was... Attention. Sending out for anyone who can hear this. October 27th and 28th. It's not dead. I repeat, it's still alive. October 27th and 28th. Calling to all VR chat and VR communities. The submissions are opening. Project Horicon is coming. I repeat, Project Horicon is coming. You don't want to miss it. Sending out for anyone who can hear this. You don't want to miss it. There's more news on their Discord. I'm attaching it now. Good luck. When news of his arrest arrived, I was the least surprised. My mother outright denies the statement, simply refusing to even suggest that my father could commit such a heinous crime as the one detailed by the reporting officers. My brother, two years younger and more inclined to my way of thinking, he regarded the news as something to have been expected. A very young, vacant-minded sister failed to grasp the severity of the crimes. Simply took the announcement as something generally bad. Circumstances of which my father would assuredly free himself, as his made-up heroes had done during their father-daughter story time. He was being held without bail at the jailhouse, about 20 minutes' drive from our home, and at the demand of our mother, we all loaded up in the family SUV and drove to meet our in turn, Dad. He sat alone in a spacious cell, presumably used to house multiple criminals in one room, though our town wasn't very known for criminal activity or anything, really, and he looked very upset. His dark blue jeans had various cuts in the fabric, as if torn by fingernails, something my mother pretended not to notice. His black sweater had at some point been spattered by something. And since I didn't remember him leaving the home that morning with any stains, I assumed they were obtained during his alleged criminal act. His skin, which had been almost orange from the unyielding summer sun, was now unbelievably pale, as if he'd been dipped in white paint and left to dry somewhere cold and lightless. Black hair, previously combed back, now sat in a downward felt mess, covering his forehead and his right eye. He didn't seem to mind the obstruction of vision. The officer who had led us to his cell said that he had said that we had ten minutes to speak with our father, and that due to the nature of my father's crime, he would have to remain in the corridor to supervise. We didn't have a family lawyer, never needed one, and the suggestion of an attorney's presence was either unheard or ignored by my distraught mother. My sister, finally realizing the realness of the situation, ran to my father and hugged him. He didn't seem to notice her embrace nor our gathering in the room. He just stared at the floor, eyes set deep in his face, encircled by darkness born of tiredness or fright, while his mouth hung open and breathless. That's what unnerved me most. In the large, quiet room where in any other city several prisoners would have been held, but in this one only our father resided. You could hear even the smallest sound. I heard my mother's unstable, ragged breathing, my brother's deep, self-calming respiration, and my sister's heavy gulps of air between her sobs. My own breathing was as steady as I could keep it, but no exhalation could be heard. From my father. He just sat there, as motionless as a cadaver, staring into oblivion, or gazing upon some remembered horror. When it became obvious that my father would not respond to our questions, of which there were many, even for myself and my brother, we left him alone and returned to the officer who escorted us upstairs into the lobby of the station. In another city, the building would have seemed underfunded, the officers ill-equipped to handle even a slow day's worth of crime, but in our town, the police openly expressed themselves to be bored out of their minds. Some even jokingly wished for an uptick in crime 
but I highly doubt the charges laid against my father were what those sentinels of peace had in mind. They laid out the full details, and due to my father's lack of cooperation, hadn't felt the need to spare us the grislier aspects. They were furious with him, absolutely disgusted by what had transpired, and I realized that the suggestion of lawyering up was merely an admonishment of formality. They wanted my father locked up, or perhaps even dead. When all had been said and my mother had been given time to process what she had been told, we drove home in silence. During the ride, my sister stared out the window and pointed at random objects, mouthing imperceptible things to herself. A child's mind wouldn't be able to fathom what she overheard during our briefing at the station. My brother stared down at his hands, which rested palm down on his thighs, his face hard, unmoving. He was old enough to comprehend the things suggested, implied, and fully revealed. I couldn't see my mother's face, but I'm sure it was a similar visage to my brother's, though probably masked to some degree by what she thought was a comforting, everything will be all right smile. My face was blank. I didn't need to come to terms with anything, and I had no difficulty in believing that my father could commit the atrocities of which he'd been accused. I was aware of my father's predilection towards violence. Six days ago, a girl had gone missing. Her name was Kelly. She was 13 years old. We're the same age. The local news reported that she had wandered off from her short walk to school with friends after something in the woods caught her attention. The two girls with whom she had been walking did not follow her, even called out to her to return to the sidewalk, but she ignored them. They ran to the school and told the staff who ran into the woods, and when they could not find her, they called the police who dispatched several officers to assist in the search. After an hour with no success, the town was alerted to the situation and a full search party was convened and dispersed throughout the woods and the outlying neighborhoods. Today, after yet another unsuccessful morning search, a man walked into the police station holding a large bag. The man knelt in the lobby of the station, cradling the bag, eyes fixated on nothing in particular but aimed at the general direction of the officers. They approached the man, asked what he held, and when he didn't respond, they opened it. Their reactions were what you expected them to be. After the immediate shock wore off, they issued somber pats to the back of my father, who still had not spoken. They initially thought that in some gravely fortuitous lone man search, he had recovered the body of the missing girl. But it was only when an officer noticed my father's hands and torn jeans that the atmosphere of the room dramatically shifted. Guns were raised and leveled at my father, orders were barked aloud and into radios, and the gloom befallen room was thrown into chaos. My father had, a tale reconstructed to the best accuracy possible given the evidence, abducted the girl during her sojourn into the woods, bisected her at the hip, hid in the lower half, and returned the upper portion to the station. The lower half, which was found in the rarely unused freezer we keep in our basement, had been preserved for a hideous purpose. Apparently the girl had been slain on the last day of her abduction, and my father had spent the previous few days behaving as if he had not been holding her captive somewhere. Where, we never found out. Why he kept her for so long before committing his secondary crime, we don't know. Some people believe the whole thing was some prolonged episode of insanity, making the largely uneducated assumption that years of heavy drinking had warped his mind while others think... It was the first of what would have been many murders, born of some genetic predisposition to savagery. My brother took offense to that, despite not having any knowledge to disprove the assertion. He was only eleven, and the seed of evil could very well be within him. I think that upset him more than the actual murder. 
chance that he could one day carry out a similar act of diabolism. My birthday is in two days. Remember how I said I could very well believe my father had done such terrible things? Last year on my birthday, my father was late to my birthday party. He and my mother argued, and in my desire to have a birthday not ruined by fighting, I tried to break up the argument. My obviously drunk father pushed me, and I fell down our stairs, fracturing my spine. I was rendered permanently handicapped. My mother, hoping to preserve the family unit, reported the incident as an accident, that I had fallen while excitedly running up the stairs to retrieve a present. I didn't deny the story, only because I wanted to believe it was just an accident, that he didn't truly mean to push me with such force. And whether my father's recent actions were born of immense guilt or, or the sick joke of a twisted mind, I'm, I can't say. Because I don't know. He won't speak to anyone. And from what I've heard during my mother's phone calls with the authorities, he won't be allowed back into civilization for quite some time. If ever. We plan on moving soon. I don't know if it'll be another small town, but I don't think it'll matter anymore. Even the smallest, most remote place can have crimes as awful as those in any big city. What keeps me up at night, and what sends a chill through my inoperative spine, is... It's the note that was attached to one of the poor girl's legs. It read, I'm sorry for what happened last year. Please forgive me. I got you some new legs. Just your size. I know they're not exactly the same. Hers are a bit less toned. But it was the best I could do. I mean, she just stumbled into the woods while I was on my walk. I didn't even call out to her or anything. I hadn't thought of what to get you for your birthday that could make up for what I did last year. And those legs. Those legs. I just knew they'd be perfect for you. Please, Melissa, please, understand. From Dad. I just want to point you guys in the direction of the snake's paw. If you guys are listening right now on a podcast, then hey, uh, you're pretty much already there. If you're not listening on the podcast and you're listening on the YouTube, then hey, you're basically already there. The Snake's Paw is written by Jack Townsend, who also happens to write Tales from the Gas Station, and Finding Vanessa, which I've heard that some of you people like. If you want to find some more of his amazing writing, as well as a full cast of voices that is brought to life within this amazing podcast that's hilarious and frightening at the same time, then I strongly, strongly suggest you check it out. That's The Snake's Paw. And you can also go to thesnakespaw.com. A big thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Jacob Fenske, Stephanie Butler, Jordan Humble, Chance Burnett, Dana Krause, Brimstone Pandemonium, Kel Tuna, William Wellington, Emma, Brenna Crow, Lakeda Canazales, Smiley the Psychotic, Dante Kincaid, Simba's Bloody Mojo, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, Bastion Beefcake, M, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Clownable, Amber Clark, Jay Kearns, Dakota Lane Whetstone, Imbo Jerry, Crusader Chocobo, Adam Arias, Estabine, Nick Cole, Our Minsect Time, Xylobones, Angelus, Seclude, Salty Surprise, Levita Galvin, That Creepy Chick, Red Shadow Cat, Turtle Man, Paralinia, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Ica Limchok, Dirty Diver 030, Matt Bach, Voice of Sand, Pike Mount, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Darth Myver, Sashi Sasaku, Croconut 509, Stricket, Freddy Kruger, Lisa Cottrell, Hades Nephew, Acid System, Mog, Kiwi the Sloth, Bester's Lampshade, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. To all of you guys, I cannot thank you enough. Thank you for being a huge support to me. Thank you to everybody who's in the description down below, and thank you to everyone who can even support $1 just on Patreon to help keep the content coming.